chapter five, we're going to look at learning and motivation. Everything that happens in the brain is due to learning. Every single thing that you know, all of your memories, everything comes down to changes in synapses. We're going to look at uh, this basic form of how learning operates in terms of calcium, building strong bones and strong memories in your synapses. And there's kind of a very interesting contrast effect here. Uh, with a lot of calcium, the, the synapses get stronger. With a little bit of calcium, the, the synapses actually get weak as a kind of error signal between what actually happens and a prediction, for example. And also, it's really important uh, that we understand motivation. Motivation plays a critical role in modulating and, and shaping learning everywhere in the brain. You may have heard almost certainly of the, the uh, neuromodulator substance dopamine. Uh, this is your classic kind of representation. There's these little neurons doubt deep down in your midbrain that, that send out this dopamine signal to the rest of your brain. And people think of it as this feel good, you know, happy drug kind of, you know, euphoria thing. Uh -uh. That ain't it. <laughs> dopamine is a nasty substance. What? What are you saying? Yes, it's true. I don't want to rain on your parade, but dopamine is, in fact, a critic. It's very, very mean. Um, and so the issue here, these are recordings from actual dopamine neurons in actual brains, monkey brains. And um, what happens is that once you learn to expect some kind of positive outcome, uh, then you don't get any dopamine anymore. I want my dopamine, but I don't have it. I'm sad. And furthermore, if you expect your dopamine because you got a signal that told you you might get some dopamine, and then you don't get the dopamine, now you're pissed, right? Now it's really bad. So uh, dopamine always is adjusting to the overall kind of level of expectation. And so as soon as you start to kind of recognize, oh, yeah, I'm pretty good at something, then you're like, OK, I'm so over that, you know, uh, I don't want to play Fortnite anymore because I, I rule at Fortnite. That's not actually true. But anyway, it's true for my kids. And, and then they, you know, they get bored and they want to do something else. And that's great. That's what moves us onward. But it's also what makes us greedy. Right. We always want more. Never satisfied. Want more, 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 more. Grinchy, grinchy. So this is the problem, right? This is the kind of issue with a lot of things we're learning about the brain. You got a double-edged sword. You got benefits, good things are happening, but also really major trade-offs here, negative outcomes, greed, uh, and all the problems that that causes in the world, okay? And it's all because dopamine is not the feel-good feel good hormone. It is driven by this critic, and it's, it's always evasive. It's always, it never wants you to kind of catch up with it. So the other thing about motivation is these kinds of ideas. This is an example from Maslow, very famous uh, kind of hierarchy of need, talking about different levels of motivational kind of drive and control that we want to achieve. And so control, this fundamental principle of control, is shaping all of our learning. And initially, you know, we're, we're really focused on kind of basic meeting basic needs. But again, dopamine gets bored with that if, in fact, your needs are met, which unfortunately a lot of times is not the case. Um, and then, you know, as you kind of satisfy these more basic needs, uh, again, dopamine gets bored and then you start moving up the hierarchy. And then, you know, if you're lucky enough to live in a, a situation where you have your basic needs met, um, you can achieve some higher level of, you know, daydreaming about moral principles and stuff like that. Uh, in this kind of highest level of the pyramid, um, but we have to really re recognize that this is a luxury uh, and, and it's kind of basically being spoiled <laughs> and greedy. But uh, yet on the other hand, you know, it's great that people can do that and think about big picture issues. Um, again, double-edged sword everywhere. In chapter six, we're gonna look at the outcome of learning which of course is memory. Memories are the results of all the things we've learned. And memory in particular, we talk about it, really takes on this fundamental kind of self-identity uh, role, uh, sort of capturing the most important events in our lives, what were meaningful, 
how these things shaped us. Surprisingly, it exists really fundamentally in this tiny little part of your brain called the hippocampus. Probably these days, most everybody has actually heard of the hippocampus. Um, and, you know, here's Morpheus <laughs> telling us from the Matrix, uh, what if I told you your, your memories are all just synaptic weights? And so this is actually this idea that, in fact, uh, everything we learn from the learning chapter is about changing the strength of the connections between neurons, those little synapses that connect neurons. And fundamentally, it's pretty much guaranteed now, we, we know this for certain, that that's how the vast majority of knowledge and everything we know about in, in our memories, all those amazing nostalgic kind of you know events that have happened and shaped us fundamentally come down to changes in synaptic strengths and in particular the changes in synapses in the hippocampus are really 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 important really powerful and we know from this case of the patient hm who had his hippocampus removed he wasn't able to form those kind of new memories and so hippocampus really plays a critical role in the formation of new memories. Here's Morpheus again. What if I told you? <laughs> Morpheus never actually says, what if I told you? <laughs> it's true. It's not in the movie. Uh, but everybody thinks, yeah, okay, whatever. That's probably not in the movie. Um, so memory is also pretty fallible. Um, and it turns out that uh, it, our hippocampus sits on top of a massive pipeline of compression that's compressing everything and you know compacting it down so that the hippocampus up here at this very high level in this diagram is just encoding the very very tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, everything that is going on in an experience and event and and therefore it's very susceptible to all of our biases our stereotypes all the things that happen when we compress information so we can learn a lot about false memories and how bad memory actually is by understanding how memory actually works. In chapter seven, we're gonna start looking at thinking and control, the highest levels of cognitive function in the brain and trying to understand, you know, how does it work? How do we actually do really complex, uh, time temporally extended, you know, uh, really hard, creative, you know, big picture thoughts? How does that work? Um, and, and a lot of work in research these days is trying to understand how artificial systems, AI, can think. Can, they, can those AI systems really think like people? Uh, it turns out in some ways they can, some ways they can't. People may have a unique combination of different kinds of mechanisms that enable us to, to kind of have the best of both worlds. But there's some way in which our brains, and I think in particular the human brain, perhaps uniquely among all the different animal brains out there, um, can emulate something called a Turing machine. And the Turing machine is really the fundamental description of how your computer works. So we think about this as the neural CPU, central processing unit, something sort of like what's in your computer, uh, but made of neurons. And neurons make that CPU really limited in some ways, but also way more powerful in other ways. And we have an ability to sort of program our own brains to do things. And we can kind of think thoughts and we can plan and we can carry out those plans. And so this ability to sort of program our own dynamic Turing machine gives us a lot of power. Um, and language plays a very critical role in enabling us to do that. And so we sort of program ourselves in our own native natural language, uh, just amazing kind of uh, things that we can do, again, that really haven't been shown in any other animal. And, and we think we have a pretty good understanding of where this stuff is coming from. And it's really the frontal cortex, again, this control area that plays a really critical role in allowing this to happen through uh, working memory and this ability to hold on to information over time and keep us on task and keep updating as we go through. Again, we come back to this critical role for motivation again and again. Motivation drives learning. Learning drives the ability and the shaping of these neural circuits. Um, and, and it really determines kind of what we uh, choose to engage in. It's kind of a tautology. We'll have to unpack that. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of important 
uh, things to be learned about. These, these quotes capture some essential points about motivation that it's hard to impose motivation on other people. Um, and, and what I'm trying to do here in this class is light a fire, show you how interesting and fascinating the brain is, um, and trying to inspire you to get motivated to learn more about this as opposed to filling you with a bunch of different facts that you don't really care about. I really want you to, to think this stuff is exciting because I think it's exciting. Um, and so, yeah, this intrinsic motivation may be a lot of individual differences in how people's intelligence turns out in terms of overall measures that we have. This is a kind of diagram of the uh, overall intelligence test that's very commonly used. Um, maybe a lot of that variance, a lot of the differences between people could be due to differences in these motivational systems. And maybe that gives us more of a clue as to how to improve educational outcomes and, and lift everybody up uh, and get uh, everybody uh, doing the best of their own potential. And I firmly believe personally, you know, outside of all of science and everything, uh, but informed by these things, that everybody has the potential to do everything, anything that they want to do. I've repeatedly had the experience where I have not understood stuff for a long time and then I stuck with it and I understood it. Um, and they, a lot of stuff has these weird names associated with it and you think there's no way I'm going to understand this kind of weird thing, a Lyapunov function, what the hell is that? That's really complicated. And it turns out it's just something really simple. Okay. <laughs> so you just have to stick with it until you fully uh, understand something and I really do believe anybody can do anything.